Hi again. We're in John Wesley Brady, starting chapter 9, which is entitled The Reassertion of the Christian Ethic. He begins the chapter with two short quotes from Wesley. First, from his sermon, The Use of Money. Neither may we gain by hurting our neighbor in his body. Therefore, we may not sell anything which tends to impair health. And then from his journal in 1753, so wickedly, devilishly false is that common objection, they are poor only because they are idle. Chapter 9, The Reassertion of the Christian Ethic. That Wesley's conversion changed his outlook from a priestly to prophetic interpretation of Christianity is a fact pregnant with the strongest ethical implications. Throughout Britain and far beyond, this transfigured man and the revival of which he was the center caused purging light to shine in deep darkness. And though for long the darkness comprehended not the light, finally a new day broke, and among the manifestations of the new dawning, which made Christ real to an apostate people, was a vehement reassertion of the potency of the Christian ethic and of its applicability to the practical concerns of life. A new faith, therefore, was creating a new conscience, and a new conscience was creating a new awareness of moral evil and social sin, which long had been accepted as normal and necessary expressions of the natural order of things. The first subhead he takes up is Wesley and the liquor traffic. Something of the vitiating influence of the liquor traffic on the social conditions in England when Wesley began his crusade, we've already seen. Lecky, a rationalist in his classic history of the period, refers repeatedly to this traffic as the master curse of England's social life. Dr. George, in her recent social researches into the life of the general populace in the 18th century, is driven to be no less emphatic concerning the centrality of this traffic as a source of corruption. Referring to the appalling moral decadence between 1720 and 1750, she says it was, quote, almost certainly due to an enormous consumption of very cheap, fiery, and adulterated spirits, unquote. But what Dr. George and most other social and economic historians have failed to recognize is that not till the challenge of the evangelical revival had touched the hearts of multitudes in all parts of the country did any semblance of redemption appear. Liquor control legislation, challenging perforce deeply rooted personal appetites before it could affect any real reform, had to be backed by strong spiritual convictions. And of such convictions, prior to the great revival, England was bankrupt. From the beginning, however, the revival, in the face of much contempt, marshaled all its forces against the organized liquor traffic as the source of a vast volume of personal and social degradation. And that Wesley became the most effective temperance advocate the English-speaking world has yet reared is a claim which will square with facts. Uh, if to Wesley the traffic in human life was the execrable sum of all the villainies, the traffic in intoxicating liquors fell easily into second place, and the vested interests behind the latter he lashed as unsparingly as those behind the former. For to him, wealth gained through beverage intoxicants was scarcely less stained in blood than wealth gained through slavery. In his sermon on the use of money, after emphasizing the Christian duty to practice industry, frugality, and thrift, he says, quote, Neither may we gain by hurting our neighbor in his body. Therefore we may not sell anything which tends to impair health, such is evidently all that liquid fire commonly called drams or spiritual spiritus liquors. Unquote. Then he continues, again, quote, Those who prepare and sell them only for medicine may keep their conscience clear. But who are they who prepare and sell them only for this end? Do you know ten such distillers in England? Then, then excuse them. But all, all who sell in the common way to any who will buy are poisoners, general. They murder his majesty's subjects wholesale. Neither do they ever pity or spare. They drive them to hell like sheep. And what is their gain? 
Is it not the blood of these men? Who then would envy their large estates and sumptuous palaces? A curse is in the midst of them. The curse of God cleaves to the stones, the timber, the furniture of them. The curse of God is in their gardens, their walks, their groves, a fire that burns in the nethermost hell, or a fire that burns to the nethermost hell. Blood, blood is there. The foundations, the floor, the walls, the roof are stained with blood. And canst thou hope, O thou man of blood, though thou art clothed in scarlet and fine linen, and fares sumptuously every day, canst thou hope to deliver down the fields of blood to the third generation? Not so, for there is a God in heaven. Therefore thy name shall be rooted out. Like those whom thou hast destroyed, body and soul, thy memorial shall perish with thee. Put in a list of the playlist. Going back, of course, to the Puritan roots of this mighty moral force that was John Wesley and his brother Charles and everything that came after them. More on the liquor traffic next time.